before I uh, I start, I was reminded by um, Dean Sterling's remarks yesterday when he framed this year's work in the lectures in terms of the 50th year of women coming to Yale as uh, to the college as undergraduates. I I re remembered my best friend from sixth grade, Donna Avedisian. Donna uh, was the only other kid in sixth grade who seriously read Greek mythology. And we both spent a lot of time cutting pictures of the Acropolis out of Life magazine and, and putting them on, on gold foil. She, um, she and I went to college in 1969, the fall of 1969. I went to a women's college, which was then known as a girls' school. I was raised academically by a faculty that was majority female. Many of them were working moms, which meant that I grew up academically knowing it was normal when a child had a ear infection that the child would be in the professor's office hours. And this told me that it was okay for me to have a serious academic profession and be a working mom. Donna came to Yale. She could not have had a more different experience in terms of nurturing. Nurturing is in scare quotes. She was in that pioneering class. It, despite the decision of the Yale admissions office, Yale University was not having a Galatians 328 moment um, in 1969. Donna felt out of place for a, much of the time that she was here as an undergraduate. She was the wrong gender, being female. And she also felt like she was the wrong ethnicity. She was not Northern European. She was Armenian. And she felt, she felt othered a lot of the time. By the time she graduated from Yale, she, had, she was a magna in her English lit degree. She started uh, graduate school in literature. She ended up getting uh, an MBA. She went out and conquered the universe. And Yale meant a tremendous amount to her in lots of positive ways. But this idea of ethnic identity being something that is something that ethnic minorities are aware of is something that is not the same in antiquity. Every minority in the Roman Empire was in the sense of all the other peoples in the group. People, ethnicity went by city in terms of how it was imagined. So, I mean, in a city-to-city -city basis, there were different people groups. So, remembering Donna, Grateful to her that she helped me get a jump start on reading Greek mythology uh, when we were 11 and 12. Um, we also heavily crushed on Mr. Darcy. Um, um, and, and thinking with, uh, with ethnic difference, I want to then move into tonight's topic, uh, which is gods in the blood. Here we go. I ended yesterday's lecture by pointing to the ways that Paul's Christology assumed the active agency of many non-Jewish gods. Christ parousia, I suggested, was something that Paul envisaged as a theomachy, a battle of the gods. As the eschatological agent of Paul's god, the biggest and best and highest god, Christ, the Davidic warrior, would soon return to bring all these other deities into line. Whether in the heavens, on the earth, or beneath the earth, that, by the way, is a Roman priestly formula for declaring war. Those, those are gods, and somehow that's in Livy, and it's, it's also in Philippians 2, as you know. Whether in the heavens, on the earth, or beneath the earth, all these non-human knees would bend to the glory of God the Father. But before we plunge back into the God-congested first century and retrace how Paul and Christ ended up tangling with so many other pagan gods, 
we first need to consider a defining moment in 20th century New Testament scholarship. E.P. San Sanders' landmark 1977 study, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Among Sanders' many goals in that great book was exposing the pejorative and systematic anti-Judaism of modern New Testament scholarship, especially the obsession with Jewish legalism and works righteousness, scare quotes, you know, the list of 613 commandments and Jews either smugly or anxiously ticking through the list to make sure they were going to be saved. Sanders urge that was simply a misdescription of Second Temple Jewishness. And this vigorous and entrenched misdescription, he said, was in service of foregrounding the especially Protestant principle of justification by faith. Um, I, was, I looked up on my phone, and my phone didn't cooperate. The year that Kazeman's great commentary was published, uh, the commentary in Romans, I think it's 1980, he said, well, Paul isn't really anti-Jewish. He just doesn't like the Jew in all of us, which means it's, never mind. That's what Sanders didn't like. And that's what he wrote this big, thick book. One of the things he wrote this big, thick book against. In John Barclay's optative assessment of 2015 and his important work, The Gift, Barclay says, Sanders, and I'm quoting him here, Sanders vanquished then prevalent caricatures of Judaism in ways that altered all subsequent discussion. 1977, Kaseman's 1980. I wish. What did bloom in the mid-1980s, claiming Sanders as its starting point, was the so-called new perspective on Paul. I suggest all of you who are going to be starting a movement, uh, either when you're still at Yale or afterwards, don't put new in the title because you're going to age out of um, that label. Anyway, it was in the 1980s, this was the new perspective on Paul. James Dunn, N.T. Wright, and Richard Hayes all made fundamental contributions. If you flip your handout over to the uh, very end of the handout, you're going to see a list of bibliography. Um, I'm going to be alluding to all of these books uh, in the course of it, but don't worry, you have the references if you decide you uh, want to look it up. So anyway, uh, Dunn, Wright, and Hayes all made fundamental contributions. After Sanders, Jewish legalism, which is thinking you can be saved by doing the law, and works righteousness as theological whipping boys were out. Still, something must have been wrong with Judaism, or Christians, Paul in particular, would not have needed to fix it. So what was the problem? Jews, answered New Testament, uh, I'm sorry, I have to change my inflection. Jews, New Testament perspective scholars answered, suffered from ethnic pride. Jews proudly clung to traditions which they thought conferred ethnic distinctions on them and ethnic privileges, things that Paul, post-Damascus, renounced. Sanders had rehabilitated Jewish law, perhaps, and Paul therefore did not renounce it. What Paul did repudiate instead, said these scholars, were the law's ethnic identity markers. Circumcision, kashrut, Shabbat, traditional purity protocols, temple worship, and so on. If this sounds to you like much of the content of Jewish law, you're right. In any case, said the New Perspective scholars, Paul was a, Paul's was a post-ethnic gospel. Paul was a post-ethnic apostle. Torah wasn't the problem with Judaism. Jews were. Welcome then to tonight's lecture, Ancient Concepts of Groupness, Sungania, and that word is in the top of your handout. In antiquity's geocentric universe, divinity, as we saw last night, was a category of power. 
that bridged heaven and earth. Another such ancient bridging category was sunginia. The word means kinship, and it implies a biological or blood connection. Sunginia also spanned heaven and earth. Gods and their humans in antiquity formed family groups. Within these units, gods, of course, were the senior members. Their humans owed them fear, loyalty, deference, and respect. In a word, pietas. Gods and humans were the two key populations in ancient empire, which could prosper only if they cooperated. Achieving such cooperation was the goal of what ancients conceptualized as paternal inheritance, literally a patrimony, and that's the second item on your handout. Benevolent cooperation between heaven and earth was achieved by enacting protocols passed down between generations. What we call religion, ancient people termed ancestral custom, and that's the details given in um, just some of the terms in item number one. These inherited protocols, protocols choreographed a group's purifications, offerings, sacrifices, calendars, rituals, domestic practices, and food ways. I just, my mother uh, was Sicilian and we always had lasagna for Thanksgiving. Don't fix what isn't broken. That's how you. That's how you saw it. it. Was terrible with turkey. Anyway, they these protocols integrated the cosmos. They bound their people group together both horizontally with humans, both living and dead, and vertically with the gods. Pietas, Latin, or Eusebia, Greek, often translated as piety meant the respectful enactment of these protocols, the display of proper deference, showing respect. Such behavior demonstrated a person's fides, Latin, or pistis, Greek, often translated as belief. The word actually means something like loyalty to or faithfulness in performing the correct deference to the god. The goal of these activities was to ensure heaven's goodwill. And given the temperament of ancient Mediterranean gods, that was a prudent thing to want to solicit. Ancestral practices shaped social belonging. They constituted one of the basic criteria for defining an ethnos or a genos or a gens. Those are all kinship terms. Across centuries and cultures, a stable concept cluster emerged. Members of a particular group shared land, language, kinship or family, again, singunia, inherited practices, ancestral traditions, and therefore gods. And if you look at um, the cluster that I have in item two, you'll see how this, this groups. Genesis 10, supplemented by its reprise in Deuteronomy 32, provides one clear and early example, and you have the Hebrew and the Greek uh, in the second uh, item. After the flood, humanity was renewed through Noah's three sons. The table of nations in this chapter traces out the descent of people groups, goyim or ethne. They are distinguished, quote, according to their lands, their languages, their families, and in their nations. It is noteworthy that gods are conspicuously missing from this bundle of ethnic identifiers. In Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9, however, when Moses reprises this episode, he speaks of gods dividing humanity in the NRSV translation as according to the number of the gods. This clustering of deities, lands, languages, and human descent groups indicates ethnic distinctions between the nations. Altogether, their global total, what Paul in Romans 11.25 will call the pleroma tonethon, the fullness of the nations, 
is 70 nations. According to these criteria, God's attached to peoples and to places. The second item in the second item is Herodotus. In his histories, he offers a similar concept cluster when he defines Greekness to Hellenicon. In his terms, Greeks are distinguished through shared blood, language, sanctuaries, and sacrifices, which implies divinities and uh, the sacred sites where the sacrifices are offered, as well as by custom, which includes those traditions that we associate with religion. Herodotus is a nice match with Moses. Some five centuries after Herodotus, another Greek thinker, Paul, defined his kinship group by invoking many of these same categories, and that's the third item under item two. Again, in his letter to the Christ communities of Rome, Paul names this group as his biological brothers. They are the adopted sons of their God. I'll return to that point in a moment. Family connection, in other words, binds together heaven and earth, as well as the individual members of Paul's group. Paul's kinsmen share the doza, the Greek for the Hebrew kavod. The RSV and the NRSV translate doza as glory, doxa, as glory. But this vague-sounding attribute actually refers to and connects heaven and earth. It points to the glorious presence of Israel's God and to the place of his presence, namely Jerusalem, or more specifically, as we should expect, in his temple, which was his earthly dwelling place. And we get the same idea in uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, has the same idea that God dwells in the temple. That's, that's where gods live, especially uh, if there, it's an active zone of sacrificing. Israelites shared the covenants and the giving of the law and the worship. These are all ancestral customs. The last item in this list, Lytreia, translated worship, means cult. And it again indicates place, the altar of Jerusalem's temple, as well as the inherited ancestral practices and traditions for enacting the cult, what Paul, Paul elsewhere calls his patrilineal inheritance, Galatians 1.14. There are several things to note about this passage in Romans that are pertinent to tonight's topic. First, Israel's family connection to its God precedes any intervention by Christ. In Paul's period, Israel's sonship is a scriptural commonplace. That's why he uses it. In contrast to the status of the ethne, Israel's sonship for Paul is not contingent upon the reception of Christ's pneuma. Israel's ultimate inclusion in the kingdom, I will argue tomorrow, is contingent on the reception of Christ's pneuma, but their sonship is not, at least according to um, Romans 11. I'm sorry, Romans 9. In contrast to the status of the ethne, the sonship is part of the family relationship, but note, however, that Paul fastidiously casts Israel's sonship as adoption, precisely because the family connection is not biological. The Jewish God took no sexual partners, human sexual partners. If humans are his children, they are not begotten, but made. Finally, Paul cannot use language as a criterion of ethnicity here because in his lifetime, Jewish populations divided up roughly between Semitic language speakers and Greek speakers. However, as we will see later on, language will still serve Paul as a key ethnic marker when he speaks of the effects of Christ's pneuma on Gentiles. Let me say something very quickly about Pneuma because that's a very important idea for tonight and for um, tomorrow. Pneuma is translated into English as spirit. And we're, I mean, the Platonists really won this one. We think of spirit as immaterial, as the, in, in a sense, the opposite of, of matter. The type of Pneuma that Paul seems to be talking about, and I side here with 
um, the work especially of Trels Engerbord Pedersen, for those of you who, who read about ancient Stoicism, uh, Pneuma is very, very fine stuff. It's very, very fine stuff, but it's still stuff. It's not, it's not immaterial. It's material. Yeah, okay, that's what it is. All right, think ghost. Patrick Swayze, you can still see him. Okay. Okay. Um, family connection also implies affective bonds, not just biological ones, at least I hope. Love binds gods to their peoples and to their lands and vice versa. Number three on your handout gives a late Roman statement of this cluster from Mybanius by way of Laura Nasrallah. Thank you, Laura, for the reference. Deuteronomy 7 gives you references to this affective bond in a much earlier text. However, for majority culture, this kinship and affect connection between gods and humans indeed expressed biological family. Mediterranean gods did take human sexual partners and had unprotected intercourse. And I don't know what the shower of gold would constitute, actually, but... Important rulers were the progeny of such divine human unions, such as Alexander the Great, the families of his successor generals, and Julius Caesar. Divine connections were politically useful, and they still are reconfigured differently in American election years. I'm not going to talk about that. Jewish scriptures, of course, also availed themselves of family language to describe God's relationship with their kings, the kings of David's line in particular. They too are God's sons begotten on the day that they are anointed into office. Sunginia also bound citizens, human and divine together. Human citizens spoke of themselves as of one genos, they were particularly responsible to and for the divine members of their curia or town council, the deus de curiones, and that's item four on your handout. Divine town councilors. Much of civic activity focused on pleasing and on placating the city's divine superintendents. Happy gods made for happy humans. Finally, gods weighed in importantly in intercity, thus international. Nazio, by the way, again, is that, is that idea of a blood connection in a, a land and, and human unit. Kinship diplomacy. Di diplomatic political relations between cities which discovered that they were relatives. Hellenistic and later Roman diplomats could weave intricate webs of agreements precisely through appeals to a shared blood connection inaugurated in the distant past by prolific deities. And uh, the book by Christopher Jones on our list, uh, item seven, is a wonderful essay on this, this, mode, uh, this political modality and antiquity. Diplomats would trace genealogies of current populations back to a common divine human ancestor couple, and that would stabilize ancient politics. This is where the Jewish God's social standoffishness complicated Jewish politics. How could Judea break into the world of Hellenistic kinship diplomacy? Newly empowered Hasmonean rulers in the minor second century managed by mobilizing the next best thing, patriarchal children. Judeans and Spartans were able to establish Sunginia. This is still in number four. Thanks to a granddaughter of Abraham, from whom the Judeans descended, because she had had a relationship with Heracles, from whom the Spartans descended. What did these ideas about divine human Sunginia mean? practically for the ways in which ancient people, including eventually ancient Christians, lived. They meant that, first of all, in an age of empire, gods bumped up against each other with some frequency, 
even as their humans did. The larger the political unit, the greater the number of different peoples gathered within it, and thus the greater plurality of the gods. And the greater the number of gods and peoples, the greater the plurality of cultic practices, since different peoples naturally had different ancestral customs. Um, James Reeves, a Roman historian, has referred to the religious situation in the Roman Empire as chaotic, and that's, that's not a bad description. It was certainly busy. Also, because of divine human sunginia, when peoples traveled, their gods did too. And I mentioned dia uh, divine diasporas uh, yesterday with the um, Parker book on Greek gods abroad. If one definition of empire is the greatest number of peoples under a single central government, we could rephrase this idea as the greatest number of gods under a single central government. Ancient empire, in other words, accommodated as a matter of course a wide range of religious practices. To see this accommodation as tolerance is to misdescribe it with the political term drawn from our own later notions of civil society. Ancient empire, like ancient family, was a steeply graded patriarchal hierarchy. In terms of power, gods, including the emperor, were on top. Any god was more powerful than any human, and in general, all gods were presumed to exist. Different gods, thus different cultic traditions, simply were. One's first loyalty was to one's own gods, those deities bequeathed by birth and blood. In other words, in Paul's day, there, here's the money sentence for this lecture, there was no such thing as a religiously neutral ethnicity, nor was there an ethnically neutral ancestral religion. This is why I translate ethne as pagans. Gentile seems like a religion neutral term, but in Paul's day, it was not. The filaments of kinship stretched from the family hearth to the upper heavens, Look at it as a kind of, instead of running on electricity, it ran on blood sacrifices. It was like a worldwide web going from the earth to the upper spheres of constant communications channeled by these protocols, channeled and facilitated by these protocols. A sensible display of courtesy toward the gods of others went far toward maintaining social peace an idea embedded in the Greek translation of Exodus 22, 28 that we saw in yesterday's handout, you should not revile the gods. Religious distinctions and differences were normal. Practical pluralism prevailed. Ethnicity, kinship, and cultural groupness, as we have just seen, was a category of government of cultic practice and of diplomacy. Ethnicity was also a category of theology, part of the social and spatial locatedness of ancient gods. Greek gods were Greek, Roman gods were Roman, Egyptian gods were Egyptian, even when, like Isis, they wandered widely. This raises a delicate question. Was Israel's God Jewish? The answer we get depends on which ancient Jew we ask, but I think for Paul, the answer according to the ancient criteria of ethnicity is yes. Since the time of the Exodus, indeed during the very days of creation according to Jubilees, which is number five on your handout, Paul's God had declared himself to be Israel's father. And it's, it's a very important um, passage in, in Jubilees. Uh, let, me, uh, let me read it. Uh, the, the angels explaining to Moses what, what went on. He, God, gave us a great sign, the Sabbath day, so that we might, we might work six days and observe a Sabbath from all work on the seventh day. 
and he told us all the angels of the presence and all the angels of the sanctification, these two great kinds, um, which according to a later chapter are circumcised, that we might keep the Sabbath with him in heaven and on earth. And he said to us, behold, I will separate for myself a people from among all the nations, and they will also keep the Sabbath. And I will sanctify them for myself. Sanctification means uh, separating them. Uh, also, I'll, I'll, I'll set them apart for myself. I will bless them. They will be my people. I, they will be my people. I will be their God. And I have chosen the seed of Jacob from among all that I have seen, and I have recorded them as my firstborn son and have sanctified him for myself forever and ever, and I will make known to them the Sabbath day. As we've seen from his list of Israel's privileges in Romans 9, 3 through 5, Paul evoked God's earthly presence as particularly located at his altar, in his temple, in Jerusalem, in Judea, which is also the place, according to Romans 11, 25, 26, where Christ will manifest at his second coming. This is item six on your handout. According to Genesis 2, God in the beginning kept that most visibly Jewish of Jewish practices, the Sabbath. According to Jubilees, God continues to keep the Sabbath every week in the company of circumcised angels. I just would love to know what that means. We'll talk about circumcised angels tomorrow. No kidding. Finally, Paul deploys the idea of ethnic language to bind God's new adopted sons, the Gentiles in Christ, into the family. Through Christ's pneuma, ex-pagan Gentiles can address God by his Jewish family name in the Jewish family tongue when God's new sons call him Abba. Is God the God of the Jews only? Paul famously asked. Is he not also the God of the nations? It's Romans 3.29. This is not a statement of God's ethnic neutrality. It is a statement in the ancient context of his trans-ethnic supremacy, something that he had been asserting emphatically since at least the period of the Babylonian captivity, when he had some explaining to do because the Babylonians destroyed his temple. The Jewish God, declared the Jewish prophets, represented the ultimate devotional destiny of all the nations. The nations would understand this only at the end. Israel knows God before the end. The definition of the nations is that they do not know God in the same way Israel does, but at the end, they will join Israel um, in knowing God. As item seven is just one of the places in Isaiah where this idea comes up. Paul's gospel echoes these great themes. And Sunganiya figures prominently in the ways that he shapes it. Paul called to the pagan nations to abandon their own gods and to worship only his God, Israel's God. And this is why, remember I told you, I tell you why, this is why. This is why and how both the apostle and ultimately the returning Christ had to fight with all of these disrespected, and therefore angry and alienated Mediterranean gods. Paul's ex-pagan Gentiles were supposed to worship his God and his God alone, according to specifically Jewish protocols, no other gods and no idols. But worshiping only Israel's God according to Jewish protocols, I'm sorry, by worshiping the Jewish God only according to Jewish protocols, Paul's Gentiles were enabled to, quote, fulfill the law. Despite the rhetoric of Galatians and the abiding tropes of New Testament scholarship and the analyses of the new perspective on Paul scholars, I want to urge, Paul's work among ethnic others was precisely a Judaizing mission. 
it is time to consider antiquity's ethnic essentialism and Paul's gospel as an instance of that. Ethnicity was not a topic of interest only of priests, magistrates, diplomats, and generals. It was also the focus of the work of classical ethnographers, geographers, and historians. In 2004, Benjamin Isaac published a magisterial work on ancient ethnography entitled The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity, and it's in the bibliographical list at the end. Isaac, Isaac in, uncovered a terrific horde of ethnic stereotyping. It's, it's, it's sort of like a, almost a Jackie Mason tape in Latin and Greek. It's unbelievable. Exotic others were routinely accused of the sorts of things of which Paul accuses pagans in Romans 1, 18 through 32. Toxic social relations, bad sex, wrecked families, and atrocious cultic activities. Antisocial practices, especially, this is a version of not in my backyard, especially cannibalism, incest, and murder, were typical of ethnic minorities. Antiso, really, no, not really. But it's, it's how the classical ethnographers defined Greekness and Romanness by using these ethnic others to, to talk about what was terrific about themselves. It can be a challenge to find a classical author who has a kind thing to say about Egyptians, Celts, Phoenicians, Jews, Germans, or Persians. Greeks had said awful things about Persians. You remember there was a bit of a confrontation between the two of them um, earlier than our period. But once power shifted west, Romans said exactly the same negative things about the Greeks. The Greeks like the Persians before them, were naturally crafty, dishonest, effeminate, slavish, and so on, and so on. In the great identity conflict between us and them, they always look pretty bad. Isaac did more than unpack the trash talk. He also explored its scientific underpinnings, how ancients theorized their ethnic stereotyping. Ethnic behaviors were set in cement, so to speak, by the original ethnic environment. Astral configurations, in particular, the way stars and planets would line up over a particular territory, conferred intellectual and cultural and social behaviors in that ethnic group. So did topographical realia. So did seasonal patterns. Negative environments caused certain cultural, intellectual, and temperamental behaviors to become hardwired in these different groups. In short, people were as they were because that's how they were. And even once they wandered, these innate characteristics remained. Peoples were as they were, to use Paul's term, fuse by nature. We are Jews, Fuse, Paul said that he said to Peter in Antioch, and not Gentile sinners, Galatians 2.15. The New Revised Standard Version translates Fuse as by birth. What it means, though, is by nature, Fusis. Fusis is an essentialist category of ancient anthropology. Slaves, too, for example, were servile fuse, and women, of course, by their very nature, are inferior to men. Paul further states here that non-Jews, the ethne, are sinners fuse. This is in part because non-Jews did not worship the Jewish God, and they compounded this problem by sacrificing before cult statues of their own gods, in the language of Jewish anti-pagan polemics, Gentiles made offerings to idols. They thereby partnered with daimonia, the lower gods, 1 Corinthians 10.20. And from this, all sorts of bad behaviors followed. Um, 
let me say something about eating and not just because it's quarter past six. Um, if, you, if you're sacrificing with a god, that's a medium of communication between the god. And um, this is also a trope in Christian martyr stories. If you get near an altar where a, a, a god or a, di um, a, a daimonion, a lower god, is hovering, you can, and if, God forbid, if you eat some of the sacrificial meat, the, the god actually enters you. You are, it's a kind of spirit possession, a, a negative kind, whereas the uh, Christ pneuma is a positive kind. So it's, I mean, the, don't even think about it. Just don't do it. Okay. What did it mean for Paul, even if it's quarter past six, what did it mean for Paul to be a Eudaios fuse? What, in other words, did all Jews as such by nature have in common? First, they worshiped the right God not to their own credit in a sense, because that God had chosen them, but they worshiped him in the right way, because after all, this God had explicitly told Israel who he was and how he wanted to be treated. God had blessed Israel with special privileges as part of his decision to elect them to be his human family. Remember, he also has an angelic family, the Bnei Elohim. Covenantal circumcision was another such advantage. Further, Jews had been entrusted, he's, uh, Paul says in Romans 3.1, with God's logia, his oracles, his, his um, yeah, divinatory texts. They had the gifts, prerogatives, and privileges listed in Romans 9 through, 4 through 5. As Paul will say a little later in Romans, all of these privileges and promises are the irrevocable gifts and calling of God. Indeed, Paul urges in conclusion, God sent Christ precisely in order to show his own ethical, I'm sorry, ethnical and ethical integrity, his truthfulness, to confirm the promises that he made to the forefathers, Romans 15, 8. This is not to say that Israel is sinless. All humanity, quote, both Jews and Greeks are under sin, Romans 3, 9. But for Paul, sin as so much else, is also ethnically inflected. Jews sin in Jewish ways and pagans sin in pagan ways. All humanity together suffers the effects of life after Adam, namely sin and death. However, since he writes primarily, if not exclusively, to ex-pagan pagans, Paul spends relatively little time on specifically Jewish sin. He does lament that his genealogical brothers are zealous for nomos in an unenlightened way. Most of them seem not to have realized that Christ is the law's telos, the righteous culmination to which nomos leads. That's Romans 10.4. In short, the Jews' prime sin, according to Paul, is that most of them do not recognize that Jesus is the eschatological Messiah. <coughs> This is a circumstance so extraordinary that Paul has to mobilize divine fiat to explain it. God is currently and deliberately disenabling most of Israel from realizing that Paul is right, Romans 11:26. Just as God had similarly exercised sovereign control over other events in Israel's history, Romans 9. In what way then do pagans sin? Well, they have more fun. What did pagans intend? What did Paul intend when he said that these ethnic others were sinners fuse? What does it imply that even once they are in Christ, these non-Jews are engrafted into the eschatological olive tree of Romans 11.24, para fusen, against their nature? On this topic, Paul stereotypes pagan behaviors with conviction. Because they worship idols, he holds non-Jews live lives mired in wrongdoing, unnatural sexual acts, distempered societies, dysfunctional families, and they not only do such things as lie, cheat, and steal by nature, but they consent to others doing them, and so on. This is a remix of uh, themes from the Wisdom of Solomon, and he lists these things as well in Corinthians and Galatians. Left to their own devices, this Fuse, by nature, is just how ethne behave. But now that the ends of the ages have come upon Paul and his generation, 
now that the Messiah has come once, been crucified, been raised, and is therefore about to come back, how can a non-Jew prepare? How, in Paul's view, can a pagan become an ex-pagan, altering his very phusis? Can there even be such a thing as an ex-pagan pagan, given Paul's ethnic essentialism? To answer this question, I would like to consider the ancient concept of acting like a member of a different people group, an idea which itself essentializes ethnicity. Ethnic verbing in antiquity, to Hellenize, to act like a Greek, to Persianize, to act like a Persian, to Egyptianize, and so on. All of these terms indicate an outsider's assumption of behaviors and customs belonging to a different ethnic and therefore religious group. Paul himself, the rhetoric in Galatians notwithstanding, demands a radical degree of acting Jewishly from his ex-pagans. Paul absolutely insists that his Gentiles in Christ assume two uniquely Jewish behaviors that were most socially conspicuous in a diaspora setting. They were to make an exclusive commitment to the Jewish God, and they were to desist absolutely from making offerings before images of their own gods. This last I will point out because people all, and don't do it in your sermons, People always say, well, the ritual laws with what he, was what he dumped. The ethical laws are always good. Not sacrificing before an idol is a ritual act. And Paul spends most of his time yelling about that. In other words, he's urging some version of Gentiles following the Ten Commandments. But he also insisted that males were not to receive circumcision though he expected them to start Judaizing, that is, to start acting more or less like Jews. The only reason that his ex-pagans were even able to do this, said Paul, was because of pneuma. Absent spirit, the circumcised Gentile might, quote, call himself a Jew, Romans 2.17, but he still couldn't act like one, and he could never be one. A circumcised Gentile would still be mired in Gentile sins. Romans 2, 21 through 23 mentions theft, adultery, and sacrilege, stereotypically pagan <coughs> sins, as Matthew Thiessen has noted. This person's frustrated inability to fulfill the law, even if he wants to, is narrated in Romans 7, reprised in Romans 13, and again, this all echoes with the lavish list in Romans 1. Though Paul himself might no longer preach circumcision, he nonetheless, as Christ's apostle to the ethne, insists that these Gentiles act Jewishly. Acting Jewishly is the ancient definition of Judaizing. Paul expected Christ-following Gentiles to be uniquely enabled to act Jewishly despite their phusis because they had been eschatologically altered by the infusion of Christ's spirit. To nod to Matthew Thiessen's work again, proselyte circumcision was mere cosmetic surgery. Infusion by pneuma was deep gene therapy. That's really a nice thought. Spirit and spirit alone, said Paul, affected Gentile adoption. God's new sons remained of a different biological lineage. That's what it means to be adopted. They were not descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers, nor, he insists, could they may be made part of fleshly Israel through flesh, which is where circumcision occurs. Pneumatic lineage is not fleshly, and that's exactly the point. By undergoing huiathesia catapneuma, by establishing a specifically pneumatic lineage through Christ back to Abraham, these Gentiles could now become, this is a Roman thought, their adopted sons so they are legitimate heirs, along with ethnic Israel. They too could inherit the kingdom. Their changed status was manifest in the brief moment between Christ's resurrection and his second coming, not ethnically, but ethically. New Gentile brothers, enabled through spirit, 
and despite their old phusis, could now fulfill God's law. That's Galatians 5.14 and Romans 13.8. In this way, Gentiles in Christ represent what Paul names the connectesis, the new creation. Their ethnic status is not altered, but their family status is. In, Mediter in terms of Mediterranean anthropology, that's a paradox. It's time once again to sum up. My historical argument has placed Paul within the universe of first century ideas of divinity and of ethnicity, of theos and songania. Both categories expressed, constructed, and coordinated relations between heaven and earth. Peoples were born into their relationship with their gods, as indeed Jews were to theirs. Ancestral traditions scripted the protocols for pleasing the gods and defined the, ethni the ethnicity of both the divine and human members of the family. In short, all religions had markers of ethnic identity, and all religions were markers of ethnic identity. To characterize specifically Jewish traditions in this way, as new prospective scholars did, is simply to observe that Jews, too, were an ancient people group. But this characterization by the new prospective scholars was not value neutral. Ethnic markers, according to them, was what was wrong with Jews and with Judaism, which Paul in particular sought to correct. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, etc., sums up this program. Jews were particularist, particularist Christians universalist, Jews fleshly, Christian spiritual, Jews are ethnic, Christians are transethnic. This putative historical description goes back academically to Bauer, arguably to Ephesians. The new, test, the new perspective's refinement was to shift the description to Jewish behaviors themselves. It is true after Sanders that Jews were no longer legalists, thinking that they earned salvation through the works of the law, but if they persisted in doing the works of the law, nonetheless, they were too Jewish. Proudly separate, according to Dunn. Belligerently, militantly nationalist, according to N.T. Wright. Wright seems to think that Paul had a problem with Theodor Herzl. Us and them did structure Paul's thinking, but this was not the dipole Christians versus Jews. In Paul's generation, what we think of as Christianity was a form of radical messianic Judaism, which is what Paul is preaching to non-Jews. He did not work for the erasure of ethnic difference, his soundbite in Galatians 3.28 notwithstanding, which I'll talk about tomorrow. He worked rather to separate pagans from pagan gods. In the here and now, by his convictions in the brief here and now, Paul insisted that male ex-pagans in Christ not join this Jewish movement via circumcision, but he nowhere tells Jews to stop circumcising. He doesn't send letters to Jewish communities. He's sending letters to Gentile communities. He's telling Gentiles not to start circumcising. If he's talking to adults, obviously he's not talking to Jews because they, that train left the station. He thereby actually reinscribes ethnic distinctions according to the flesh because Jews are circumcised and Gentiles are not. Paul insisted that eschatological Gentiles are to be mercifully included in God's impending kingdom, but they are to be included as Gentiles. And if you look at number eight on your handout, you'll see a long lineage of that idea in canonical and extra-canonical late Second Temple and post-Second Temple texts. And you'll also see in item number nine, Paul's reprise of this idea, Gentiles joining with Israel, but not joining Israel, when God's last put out the light is spoken. Gentiles, in other words, retain their fleshly status, but that status is irrelevant to the redemptive process since they have now been adopted. Gentile pneumatic status is all that matters. It is in this regard that Gentiles in Christ constitute at this moment of the movement, the turning of the ages, a new creation. 
And it is for these Gentiles and for them alone that circumcision is nothing. Ancient gods did not take insult lightly, and neither did their humans. Paul experienced pushback from both groups, quote, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. But separating pagans from their gods and redirected them to the exclusive devotion to Israel's God was the modus operandi of this apocalyptic Judaizing movement. As he turned pagans from their gods to his God, Paul was both a witness to and an agent of eschatological transformation. Divine pneuma had been poured out upon and into the nations. Paul's vocation as an apostle to the nations thus inevitably involved him with the nation's gods as well. But Paul and his apostolic colleagues were not afraid. This uneven struggle between gods and humans, remember, gods are more powerful than humans. This uneven struggle was about to be resolved in, by the impending victory through the Messiah of Israel's God, the resurrection of the dead, the transformation of the living. Tomorrow evening, we will consider what happens when time ends and also when it doesn't. History and theology identity and ethnicity, sameness and difference. We're steering by Schweitzer. And remember Reverend Hugo's billboard. See you tomorrow, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Fredrickson, for a very stimulating lecture. Cher colleague. Okay, um, I have some thoughts about point eight. You know, as someone who worries about genre and thinks a lot about apocalypticism, this list <laughs> looks more like prophetic eschatology than apocalyptic eschatology to me. Yes, you're absolutely right. Do you so, want to explain to? Yes, that. Um, you know, the, the list of things that, the bullet points after pagans bury their idols, um, you know, space, time, the earth, and human bodies are the same as before. Yes. There's a big change in pagans wor worshiping the God of Israel and some uh, ethical improvement, but it's not the kind of radical change that's involved in apocalypticism. So that either this is the, if, if these bullet points are the end time, then it's prophetic eschatology. But if it's an interim time, like the thousand year reign in Revelation, or the reign of the Messiah in fourth Ezra, then comes, you know, the radical, you know, either the uh, passing away of heaven and earth and a new heaven and earth that's quite different. Does and everybody the understand the point that was just made? I did not ask, Professor Collins to set me up for tomorrow's lecture, but I thank her for doing so. Good. The difference between prophetic eschatology and um, what's happening, uh, or what Paul is convinced is happening, is is something. Thank you. Yes, you, didn't ma you made it more clearly than so, I did. So in point nine, I think all those things happen. Uh, well, I think Paul's eschatology is somewhat apocalyptic. You know, Romans eight. Human bodies will be redeemed. That means they will be transformed into glorious spiritual bodies. And creation will be redeemed in an analogous way. So it's hard to imagine that he would think of the earth and space and time going on as usual. Correct. But perhaps we'll or, or, that tomorrow. I think you're right. Can we both be wrong? I don't think so. We can both I, be yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Stay tuned. Thank you so much. Thank you for making my point much more clearly than I was planning on doing tomorrow. That's excellent. Please. Uh, my name is Bing. Uh, please, S please speak up. Uh, my name is Bing, uh, STM student uh, in liturgical studies. Um, so, uh, I think you talked about the relationship between um, uh, the ethnicity and the locatedness or location. So I just wonder when Paul said uh, he flipped idea about um, 
the ethnic identity uh, of Israelites in Galatians 4, uh, in, in the examples of Hagar and Sarah, mm -hmm. it seems that he cut uh, this relationship. So it's like... Does everybody hear the question and understand it? What Can you speak into the mic and... Yeah, so in Galatians, in. in Galatians 4, uh, when Paul talked about Sarah and Hagar. Yes, so the Hagar, Sarah, Dipole. Yeah, so it seems like uh, he changed the ethnicity uh, of Israelites, Israelites to another location, but he said it's like allegorically. So I wonder what, what's your idea about exposition, uh, exposition of this part of us. Well, I do exegesis of Galatians 4. Um, I will say that I think Paul in Galatians is arguing against other apostles of Christ who want Gentile males to be circumcised. That's not about Judaism versus Christianity. It's about two different modalities of the Jesus mission. And that's how I would look at that. And what I want to, I mean, Galatians is one of those particularly radioactive letters. What I'm, the reason why I burdened you with so many pages of nine-point font handout is because I've tried to give you wallpaper against which to put Paul's letters. Galatians 4 can't give us its own interpretive context. We have to think with ancient ideas of ethnic essentialism and think about the context that Paul the sea that Paul is swimming in, and it's within that interpretive context to look at um, at what he's saying and standing on one leg, which is all I have time to do right now. That's how I would look at Galatians 4. Thank you for your question. <laughs>